Well, today we're going to talk about something that may be the most important thing that I've talked about so far. And here's what we're talking about today, conflict resolution. Now, I realize that for most of you in the room, uh, you don't need to hear this at all because you've never had an argument in your marriage. You've never had a disagreement. You wake up every morning to the sound of angels' wings flapping, and miraculously, God just pipes heavenly music into your bedroom as you softly open your eyes to a gentle sunrise. Um, But for the rest of us, okay, uh, we have arguments from time to time. Hopefully, you don't argue all the time. But even if you do, I want you to know that what we're going to talk about today is going to help every marriage have hope. The good, the bad, and even the bitter. There are some bitter marriages. You know that, right? Um, Some marriages are bitter because of some past hurt. And by the way, marriage does not cause problems. Because you bring hurts and habits and hang-ups into marriage with you, marriage doesn't cause problems, it just reveals them. And here's what Jesus said, it is impossible, but that offenses will come. Why is that? Because we are fallible human beings. And when you take even two Christians, one Christian who's fallible and Even though he or she has been redeemed and changed and saved, they still have a fallen nature. They still have the old man on the inside. Uh, And you take them married to another person just like that, and you put two people together, there's going to be conflict. And, And that is just absolutely inevitable. So the key is how you deal with these conflicts and how you can work through these. So we're going to go to the book of Ephesians, uh, chapter 5, a very famous passage where God commands husbands to love their wives. So let's look at Ephesians 5, uh, and we'll read verses 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So, so once again, it, does God command women to love their husbands? Yes, in other passages, but he makes a more specific command for the husband to love his wife. Why is that? Well, I think women uh, tend uh, to be more loving. They tend to respond uh, especially to love. And so God is reminding husbands that first and foremost, They've got to keep that relationship at the top of the agenda. You see, it's easy for, and this is not just for men, but it's easy for husbands especially and wives, uh, once you get married, to get busy with life. You get busy with your career. You get busy with the kids when they come along. I mean, every mom here knows when you have kids, then, you know, you no longer have any time. I've talked with some moms that their greatest fantasy was to get 30 minutes alone in the bathroom or just to be able to use the bathroom by themselves without being bothered. So life happens. And so what God is reminding us is that we've got to have that relationship with Christ first and foremost, but we've got to work at keeping our marriage at the top of the list. Why did Jesus give himself up for the church? That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now understand that God says marriage is to be like the relationship between Christ and the church. And what Christ did for us is he uh, cleanses us, that he wants to present the church to himself in splendor. In other words, he wants it to be wonderful. He wants it to be majestic. He doesn't want it to be just run of the mill, but rather he wants this to be a special relationship so that we can be holy. The word holy means set apart. 
You know what God wants for your marriage? He wants it to be set apart. You know what God wants for the relationship between husband and wife? That it's special, that it's set apart, that it's sacred, that it's not like other relationships. And so uh, he does this so that we uh, can be in right relationship with him. Now, I could spend weeks preaching from just these three verses. There's so much in it. Um, There are many, many points that I could talk about, but I'm not going to spend weeks today, all right? I'm just going to talk about three points that we find in this text that maybe you've not seen marriage in this light before, but I think three things that will help you learn how to resolve conflict when it happens in your marriage. And here are the three words, love, reconcile, and sanctify. You may not have thought of the word sanctify uh, in relation to marriage, but this is what Jesus shows us about how his relationship with the church is and how our relationship with each other is supposed to be. Now, these are three verbs. They're three action verbs. So these are three actions he wants us to take uh, in our lives and in our marriage. We are to love we are to reconcile, and we are to sanctify. So I'm going to talk about those three words. First of all, conflict resolution requires Christ-like love. Let's begin there, with love. Love, God's love for us, Christ's love for us, there are a few things about it. It is unconditional. Now, when you love unconditionally, you do not love purely based on emotions or feelings. Now, emotions and feelings are certainly involved. But the fact is, unconditional love means that I love even when it doesn't feel good. Even when it feels like the other person's not loving me back. Even when it feels like they don't deserve to be loved. Unconditional love is just, as it says, without condition. So what does God want for a marriage? If you're going to resolve the conflict in your marriage, you must love unconditionally, no matter what, even on grouchy days, even when your husband says something that hurts your feelings, even when your wife does something that hurts your feelings. The fact is we've got to love unconditionally. That builds the foundation for conflict resolution. Remember, conflict is inevitable, So you got to love unconditionally. Uh, Christ's love is also freely given. He gives it to us absolutely so freely and generously. And so what you and I must learn to do in our marriage is to give love freely like Christ does for us. And then uh, love is to be self-sacrificing. Often I talk with young people getting married and uh, they have this mistaken idea that Um, marriage is a place for self-fulfillment. Now, understand, marriage certainly should be fulfilling, okay? Marriage should be fulfilling to us. But marriage is a place of self-sacrifice, not self-fulfillment. And here's the funny thing about it. When you are self-sacrificing, you are fulfilled. It is God's way to find fulfillment in marriage. And once again, it's not about pleasing yourself. It's about pleasing the other. And so uh, conflict resolution requires that foundation of Christ-like love. Love takes responsibility and intentionality. So in other words, it takes responsibility for itself and its own actions, and it must be done on purpose. Listen to Galatians 6, 5. We are each responsible for our own conduct. Now, that's the opposite of how we think, right? Well, if she hadn't have done that or said that or whatever, then uh, I wouldn't react this way. No, you take responsibility for your own conduct. Well, if he hadn't have treated me that way, no, the Bible says take responsibility for your own conduct. Conduct. You can't blame it on your circumstances. You can't blame it on the way you were raised. You can't blame it on the fact that your spouse has changed. Of course she has changed. Change is inevitable. And we love through that unconditionally. 
So you need to understand that a lot of people, they do not take responsibility and they are not intentional about it. And as a result, they begin to think, well, the reason we are growing apart is that we are incompatible. You ever heard that before? We're just simply incompatible. Or for many, it's irreconcilable differences. Did you know that incompatibility is a myth? You know why? Because we are all incompatible. Every person in this room, unless Jesus Christ is physically here, every person in this room is incompatible because you have a sin nature. So this idea that, well, the reason I'm growing apart is simply because we have become incompatible. No, you have stopped taking responsibility for your actions and you are no longer being intentional in your love. So once again, we're talking about the foundation for being able to resolve conflict. And then love manages expectations. I talk to many people that have unrealistic expectations. Let me talk about that in a second. Um, Unrealistic expectations set you up for failure and frustration. They do every time. If you have unmanaged or unreasonable expectations, you are going to be disappointed. Let me just give you an example of the way every one of us starts out in a very odd way, to be honest. Uh, We start out with the wedding, which is a gigantic party. Nothing wrong with that. It's a beautiful celebration. And then following that is the honeymoon. Now, let's think about unrealistic expectations in light of the wedding and the honeymoon. When it comes to baby girl at her wedding, she has been looking at bridesmaids or bridal magazines since she was four years old. All right. And she ain't no dummy. Uh, she's, she looks beautiful. It took her three days to get that way, all right? And uh, to make her even look more ravishing, she makes sure that every bridesmaid wears a really ugly dress. I'm not kidding. Have you ever seen anybody wear a bridesmaid dress outside a wedding? No, you have not. Why? Because they are intentionally made to look you, make you look bad so that baby girl can look good, right? You know what I'm talking about. And people give you free stuff. The honeymoon is perfect. You don't work or clean or fix your own food. You sleep late and you have sex all the time. And you're both always in the mood. And then you get married. And then you begin to live life. And then what happens? After the wedding, you argue over money. You have to work. You have to clean. You have to fix your own food. And for some people, that's a bit of an adventure. You have to get up early and surprise. Baby girl ain't always in the mood at that point. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying that love manages expectations. If you're going to build the foundation for conflict resolution, you got to manage your expectations. Don't expect perfection because that's not going to happen until you get to heaven. What you plan for and what you expect is progress, Okay. So if you're going to manage the conflict, you've got to manage your expectations. And then you also need to understand that love celebrates the differences that you understand and appreciates the ones that you don't. Ladies, can I tell you something? Try as hard as you like, but you're never going to fully understand a man. You're never going to fully understand the way he thinks because, and here's the reason, you think that a man thinks like you do. A man does not think like you do, okay? Uh, Let me tell you, and most women don't get this, because I can remember me, when Kim and I were dating, uh, she'd look at me and I'd be having that thousand yard stare, you know, and she'd be like, baby, what you thinking about? And you know, I'm not a dummy. Uh, I knew what she wanted to hear and I'd be like, oh baby, I'm thinking about what our kids are gonna look like one day, you know? And she just like, oh, that was so romantic. But you know what I was thinking about? I was thinking about a sandwich. That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> I, I wonder if for a dollar thirty-two I can get a Big Mac. That's what I'm worried about. Ladies, let me help you understand a man. He thinks about a couple things. Only normally, I mean, not, not, men are not this simple, but pretty much, yeah, they are. I mean, they're thinking about food. They're thinking about sex, and then they might think about football or something. Okay, so. Uh, men are not super complicated 
And so here's what I'm saying. Try as you may, you're never going to fully understand him. You're not going to understand his aggressive tendencies. You're not going to understand the way his emotions operate. But what you need to understand is that you need to appreciate the differences that you do understand and accept the ones that you don't. Because men, let me tell you something, and I don't I even have to say this, you don't understand your wife at all. I mean, you understand her sometimes, but when she begins to think like a man, you understand that, okay? But you don't understand her emotions. I, my wife, and she is the most wonderful woman in the world. She is the sweetest woman I've ever known. And that woman can cry at a kitten commercial or at, you know, somebody getting flowers on tele- I, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking at them like, what? Why are you crying? You know? She's like, it's just so, it makes me so happy. I'm like, well, you know, I associate tears with sadness, not with happiness. But there's a difference between men and women. My point is this. Celebrate the differences you understand. I thank God that my wife is different than I am. I wouldn't be very attracted to her if she was just like me. But I thank God for those differences, and I celebrate the ones I don't understand. Because I don't understand a lot of them. But you know what I've learned to accept is that that is a part of the beauty and the mystery of marriage. God made us that way. But don't ever underestimate the differences. Opposite do, opposites do attract, but they normally attract trouble. All right, so uh, you need to understand those differences. God made us to be attracted to opposites. It lets us know that we are incomplete and that we need others. But what fascinated you before marriage can frustrate you afterwards. So once again, we're talking about building this foundation for being able to resolve conflict. And then love does not keep score. If you want to be able to resolve conflict in your marriage, don't keep score. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love doesn't keep score of the sins of others. Now, I wonder if you're one of those people that you keep score. I remember back four years ago on a Thursday afternoon, here's what you said. I'm like, really? You know? Um, I don't remember... I barely remember what I had for breakfast this morning, okay? I'm not going to remember anything from four years ago that I said, all right? So don't keep score. That is a way to lose. That is a way never to resolve conflict. So that first word is the word love. Here's the second word. It's reconciliation. So in this text, God commands us because he tells us to follow the example of Jesus We learn from that that conflict resolution requires swift reconciliation. Swift. You say, why do you say swift? Because you need to commit to resolving conflict now. Don't wait. Don't let it fester. Don't let it boil over. Learn timing, okay? Sometimes people get into arguments because they don't understand timing. You know, if your spouse is really, really tired and you try to bring up something that is going to cause an argument, then wait until you both are relaxed, okay? Here's what Ephesians 4, 26 and 27 says. Don't go to bed angry. Now think about that. Don't go to bed angry. Some of you are like, well, I wouldn't get much sleep, all right? Don't go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that kind of foothold in your life. Do you see what that does? That gives the devil a foothold when you don't commit to resolving conflict now. Now, we all want intimacy and closeness, but you know what the price of that is? Reality. Reality. You want someone close to you. You want someone to be loving to you. And the price for that is reality, and there is no perfect person. So you need to seek reconciliation, not perfection. This is important. Seek reconciliation, not perfection, and then forgive freely. 
If you're going to resolve conflict, you've got to forgive. Colossians 3.13, you must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. So here's what he's saying. You need to be quick to forgive. That needs to be the default position. Now, I'll say this. The Bible does talk about confrontation. Um, in Matthew, it talks about that, you know, if you've got a problem with another person, you go to them and how you confront them. The Apostle Paul wrote that we're to speak the truth in love. But those require confrontation. You don't get better by ignoring things. You don't get better by sweeping it under the rug. You don't get better by never dealing with the problem, okay? The problem that most of us has, we have, is we deal with symptoms rather than root causes, okay? So learn to deal with the problem. But here's what the Bible says. You must speak the truth in love. So forgive before you confront. You just make a determination. I'm going to forgive my husband. I'm going to forgive my wife before we commit to talking about this. And then when you do confront, confront in love. Now, we've talked about forgiveness. Let me define that for you a little bit because this is important. You need to learn what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not forgetting. People say, well, I'll forgive, but I'm not going to forget. I think what people mean is that by saying that, they're not really forgiving. But let me just say, if you got hurt and you can forget it, then you weren't hurt very much. Think about that. Uh, let's say something, someone physically or sexually abused you growing up. Any chance you're going to forget that? Absolutely not. Now you can forgive, but you're not going to forget that because that was a big deal. Let, let's say that uh, your spouse abandoned you. Let's say that you were rocking along, you thought things were fine, and your spouse said, I want a divorce. Are you ever going to forget that? Will there be a day that you don't remember being married to that person? And No, you're not going to forget that. So forgiveness is not forgetting. Uh, forgiveness is not condoning the offense. And here's where people get twisted up with forgiveness a lot of times. They think that if they forgive, it means they're condoning the actions of that other person. I read about this family that they were Christians, and their daughter was murdered by this man. It was out on the West Coast, and he got life in prison. And you can imagine those parents were all torn up about this. But God really began to work in their heart about forgiving. And they made an appointment to go and visit that man that murdered their daughter. They visited him in prison. Now, if I had visited my tendency would have been to gloat, to say, you ain't never getting out of here, and to be angry. But you know what this Christian couple did? They went in, and with tears in their eyes, they told this man, we forgive you. And he thought they were playing a hoax on him. He didn't know how to deal with this or how to react. And eventually, the man ended up getting saved uh, there in prison. But someone asked this couple, how could you do that? And they talked about how that if they had this bitter, unforgiving spirit, that it was going to destroy them. And so they forgave. But forgiveness is not condoning the offense. And then forgiveness is not ignoring the hurt. You got to deal with the hurt. You don't ignore it, okay? But you've got to learn what forgiveness is. Okay, it's not those things. Here's what it is. It is abandoning revenge and releasing the offense to God. Very specifically, when I forgive, I'm releasing it to God. Listen to what Romans 12, 19 says in the message. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. So when you forgive, you release the revenge factor. You begin to say, God, 
you take care of this. I can't, I can't handle it emotionally. I, I can't even get my head around this. And so by faith, I'm mouthing the words, I forgive this person. And then Hebrews 12, 15, guard against turning back from the grace of God. By the way, do we not do that? We don't want to turn back from the grace of God in our own life. We want grace. We want forgiveness. But when it comes to giving it to others, we are tempted to turn back from it, aren't we? He says, let no one become like a bitter plant that grows up and causes many troubles with its poison. Do you know that an unforgiving spirit is like poison to your soul? And the truth is that we have to learn to release this to God. I uh, read a letter from a woman one time several years ago, and uh, she was writing about she and her husband had gotten a divorce, and her husband had an affair. And there was no condoning that, but the man did repent. And listen, no matter what your offense is, whatever your sin, you turn to God and he forgives he truly repented. He wasn't just sorry he got caught. He truly repented. And for about three years, he tried to convince her and he tried to pursue her and he tried to reconcile with her, but she would have none of it. She would not forgive. She wanted her pound of flesh. Well, eventually that man said, you know, this is of no use. And so he went on with his life and he ended up meeting a a very nice Christian woman and they fell in love and they got married. And this woman who had been cheated on, she had been hurt. In her letter, here's what she said. When I see them, she said, they seem happy. She said, but when I look in the mirror, I'm not happy. All I see is a bitter, old, angry woman. And what she did not realize was that by holding on to that unforgiveness, by not releasing it to God and letting God be the one that shores it up, takes the revenge, holds accountable, then she was destroying herself. Well, forgiveness, you know what it is? It's unconditional. And it is a process. You know, don't think that, especially with deep hurts, don't think that, you know, Oh, I just say it one time and I don't ever think about it again. That's not true. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew 18. Peter asked, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? Can't you just hear the, the proud voice of Peter as he's saying, he's so proud. You know, God, God, give me a gold star. I'm so, so spiritual. I'm going to forgive up to seven times, God. Aren't you proud of me? No, Jesus replied. Seventy times seven. Now, before you start doing your math and that equals 490 times, he does not mean that after 491 times, then you can punch him in the nose. That's not what he means. The point is that there's two points to this. Forgiveness is a process. Sometimes you've got to do it again because you'll feel that old bitterness just well up in you. I, I've had to deal with that in my own life. A number of years ago, there was a man that lived in our neighborhood. We, we don't live in that same neighborhood anymore. But he said something to me in a public forum that was an insult to me about my kids. And I don't know how you are. You can say bad things about me all you want. I get a lot of bad things said about me. It comes with the position that I'm in. But you say something about my kids and my God, we're about to fight, all right? That's all I'm going to say. And um, I can remember, it was, I, I just kind of tried to verbally destroy him. Probably wasn't successful, but I sure didn't make an attempt at it. And I can remember for a long, long time, and I'm a pastor, okay? I remember for a long time after, that man used to walk in our neighborhood every day. And I had to drive by him almost every day. And I cannot tell you the number of times. And I wasn't going to do this, but the devil is on my shoulder saying, run over him, run over him, run over him, (laughs) run over him. And it got to the point that I had to have a serious talk with myself. I had to pray. Lord, this is not healthy. This man has no, he doesn't even know my name probably. 
He's not bothered by it. Here I am, every time I see him, I'm angry. And I had to release that. I had to release it to the Lord and let God take care of it. And when I did, I didn't think about running him over as much. All right, so <laughs> I'm being honest. I'm not going to say never thought about it again because, you know, I had to deal with that. All right. But the point is that forgiveness is a process. Um, and, and the second part of that is it's going to take time. It's going to take time. The deeper the offense, the longer it takes. You, by faith, say, I forgive. And when you do, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, here's the final point, the word sanctification. And this is probably not something you've thought about in terms of marriage before. Conflict resolution requires sanctification. So what do you do? You got to build that foundation of love. It's unconditional. It's freely given. You, you begin to express it, okay? And then you resolve to commit to conflict resolution now. You, you don't go to bed angry. You learn what forgiveness is. You got to have heaps and heaps of forgiveness. You confront in love. You forgive before you confront. And then the last part is the thing that takes it home. This is what makes it different for Christians. Uh, conflict resolution requires sanctification. Jesus saved us to sanctify us. That word is in the text that we read today. The word sanctify, you know what it means? It means to set apart. It means to consecrate or to build up. Now, when you think of resolving conflict in your marriage, if you think, I need to build up my wife. I need to build up my husband. You're going to be able to resolve conflict much more quickly, much more effectively. If you think that by consecrating your spouse, setting them apart, making them special, you say, well, you know, they don't deserve to be treated that way. Neither do you, neither do I by God, but he does it. Because of his love. Once again, that's why the foundation of love is so important. Let, let, let me wrap it up with this. When something is sanctified, it's treated differently. Do you remember? I don't know if you had this or not, but my grandmother had a room in her house that we grandkids were not allowed to go into. In fact, nobody really was ever allowed into that room. It was that special room. She had, did anybody have this? She had furniture that was covered in plastic in that room. Anybody ever have something like that weird? Okay. Um, and my grandmother, she would, and she loved her grandkids, but she like, you know, I, I got more of them. All right. I can get rid of you. If you, if you don't do what I say, boy, I'm going to take you out, you know. And I can remember wanting to go in there and play. But that room, you know what that room was? It was sanctified. It was set apart. It was built up. And to be honest, it was built up as something that really wasn't because it wasn't that great. I'm going to be honest with you. And then, uh, you know, when she wasn't there, when I was a little bit older, I would just go in there and just sit on uh, that plastic, you know. I was tempted to sit naked on it, but I did not do that. All right. So because I'm like, I'm going to show you granny, you know, anyway, but that room was sanctified. Now. Here's the point. You need to build up to give extra care for your spouse. And when you do, you can resolve conflict. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help each of us in our own marriage, in our own relationships, to commit to resolving the conflict. Because it's going to happen. It's inevitable. There are times that each of us is going to get upset there are times that each of us is going to get in an argument. But Lord, help us to commit to resolving conflict now. I pray that you'd help those that need to forgive to do it because of what you did for us. I pray for those that are struggling in their marriage. God, that you just put your protection on them. Bless them. Build them up. You sanctified us. Help them to sanctify each other. 
And before I finish my prayer, if today you'd like to receive Christ as your Savior, online or in the room, you can ask Jesus to be your Savior. You can pray something like this. Dear Jesus, I believe you died on the cross and rose from the grave. And I believe you died for my sin. And I'm asking you right now to save me. I ask you to come into my life and to change me forever. If you did that online, click the button at the bottom of the screen to let us know that you received Christ today. In the room, fill out the next step card and let us know that today is the day that you receive Christ. And then two final things for those that have already been saved. How many would say, Pastor, pray for me. I need help forgiving. Could be your spouse, could be somebody else. But you'd say, I struggle with that. Pray that God will give me the faith to forgive. Would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Lots of folks. Lots of folks. Father, I pray that you'd help each of us to forgive as we have been forgiven. Help us to do it freely. Even when it's hard. Even when we don't feel like it. Even if we feel like, well, I'd be hypocritical because that's not how my emotions are. God, you're interested in our actions, not just our emotions. And then last thing, Hammy would say, Pastor, pray for my marriage. I want it to be blessed. I want God's touch on my marriage. There's some of you that have been married for a really long time. And you know what? Kim and I have been married for 36 years. But you know what I want on my marriage? I want God's touch. I want His blessing. Hammy would say, Pastor, pray that God's blessing will be on my marriage. Raise your hand. God bless you. Lord, help us to live in light of the gospel. Help us to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We hope the message you heard today encouraged you and strengthened you in your walk with Jesus wherever you are. If you know of someone that could use today's message, be sure to share it with a friend and also hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single message. If you feel led today to give towards the mission and vision, you can do so by clicking the give button on the screen. Thanks so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.